Hey, hey everybody, I'm Ross Myers with Bunker Munitions, and today I'm going to do a little bit different of a video. I want to go through and tell you the process of getting an FFL, particularly a home-based FFL, which is what I am, and I've been at this for a year this month. Um, I've had my FFL for an entire year. I decided back in May of last year that's when I filed for my Articles of Organization to become an LLC. So I'm going to start from the top, tell you how that process went, everything that I needed to do, and then whether I think it's worth it or not. So the first thing you have to do is get your Articles of Organization. These are filed through the Secretary of State in Georgia. It's a $100 fee. You pay that, and I filed it on May 11th. And by June 9th, I'd received back from uh, the Secretary of State saying, I'm an official LLC. So in June of 2021, I became an official business. All right. Now, with that, you have to apply for your employee identification number through the IRS. That's going to be used on all your tax work, your paperwork, everything. That, that shows that you are an official business and in that same realm as soon as you get your articles of organization you have to list your address your business name all that type of information your mailbox is going to be flooded with all these companies wanting you to hire them to help you get their your EIN help you through the process and it's completely not necessary they're basically scams uh, I don't I hesitate to call them a scam because I'm sure they do what they say they're going to do but they are going to charge you money 100 bucks 200 bucks 300 bucks for something that is free and you could do yourself with a little bit of research on the internet and some guidance you definitely don't have to deal with that so but in May, I decided this is something I wanted to do. I applied through the Secretary of State. June, I had it. All right. And applying for your EIN is free, by the way. So I got my EIN, and as soon as I did that, since I'm a home-based FFL, I had to apply for my home occupation application. And that just basically tells my city, my county, that, hey, I plan on running a business out of my home. They're going to ask you a bunch of questions on the application, ask you things like, um, or tell you things that you can't put signage in the yard, you know, you can't have a big billboard in your yard in a neighborhood or certain communities. Um, your HOA, if, you have, if you're unfortunate enough to live in an area that has an HOA, um, they're probably going to be contacted and nix that pretty quickly, but luckily I don't have one of those here. And my county worked with me really well. I was able to, to get my home occupation application. Uh, it was a $20 fee, and I heard back very quickly from them. They asked how many square footage of my home I plan to use for business purposes, if I expected to have more deliveries than a normal residents would have like I can get deliveries of my products in but they don't want 18 wheelers driving through residential uh, areas and neighborhoods delivering you pallets of goods based off of whatever your business is so that wasn't an issue with me being an FFL and I was able to accomplish that so after I got my home occupation application squared away and I was given the thumbs up by the county I started following my paperwork for the ATF I did that through their website in July of 2021. So it's pretty extensive paperwork. It's not complicated, but it is a fairly long process. You have to go to the sheriff's office, you have to get fingerprinted, you have to get a passport quality photo taken, attach all that to the documentation. You have to give a copy of all that documentation to your local law enforcement officer. So the same application that I sent in to the ATF requesting to become an FFL, I also sent, uh, well, just hand-delivered a copy of the packet to 
uh, the sheriff of the county that I live in. And it, it's more of a courtesy to let him know that, hey, there's going to be an FFL starting in his jurisdiction. Uh, sorry for the light. I'm standing next to some windows in my living room. The sun keeps going up and down. So a little bit of lighting, but we'll get through it. All right. So after I sent my paperwork off, about five weeks later, I heard back from the ATF. They told me that they wanted to set up a at-home interview or at-your-place-of-business interview. They send an agent to your business, and they're going to sit down and do an interview with you. So during that time frame, the several weeks that I had, I filed with the Office of Commissioner of Insurance. That's one of the things you had to do, which is an Illegal Immigration Reform and Enforcement Act Citizen Affidavit Form. That's a pretty big, I'm not even going to try to read it again. But I did that in August, signed off on it, had to take it to my bank. They notarized things. He notarized it for me. I turned that in. Also, due to the nature of being an FFL, I had to go to the office of the Commissioner of Insurance and Fire Safety for the state of Georgia. Uh, they also helped me get my explosives license which I'll talk about in just a little bit. Not necessary, but I, I, I did get it. So on August 25th, I had my FFL interview. Took the day off work. Uh, agent showed up at my door. He was very nice. Brought him in. He kind of looked around a little bit. We sat down at the table and he brought a pretty big stack of paperwork with him. And it, it's not a really intense interview they ask you pretty basic questions. If, if you're a person that can legally buy a firearm, you can pretty much start an FFL, as long as you're not a prohibited person. Uh, so it was a lot of instructions teaching me how things worked, teaching me, you know, this is the process. Every time you sell a gun, this is what you have to do. This is what you have to go through. Um, and they also want to make sure that you have intent to be a business. That is a big part of becoming an FFL. You can't get an FFL for personal use only. So to try to avoid, you know, markup that stores have, which by the way is not very much, um, and just get a direct shipment from distributors for your own personal use, you can't do that. You have to have intent of a business to have an FFL, except for your type three, which is your curio and relics. Anything that's 50 years or older uh, is considered a relic. You can apply for one of those. The process is not nearly as stringent, and that makes it so if you were to buy, you know, old war, World War I guns, things like that, instead of having to go transfer them through your local FFL, they can be sent straight to your home. Um, but when I did my interview, I applied for a type one and a type six type one is your basic retail, uh, being able to sell guns and gunsmithing activities. I also applied for my type six at the same time, which was manufacturer of ammunition. If, if you made ammo or wanted to sell reloads, you would, you would need that. That's also where the explosive license came in because the amount of black powder and smokeless powder that I'd have on my property needed to be documented um, with the county. So your type one license that I applied for was a $200 fee. It's good for three years and the type six for the manufacture of ammunition was a $30 fee. And it's also good for three years. But I got both of those and they came pretty quickly. He told me at the end of the interview that he was going to recommend me for an FFL. You know, I mean, he, he told me right there and he said I could expect it in a few weeks. And that's about when it came. Uh, three to four weeks later, it came in hand. So once I got that, I was able to apply to be a part of the NIC system. Well, n not apply, sign up to access the National Instant Criminal Background Check System. 
And that's what we run. Every time someone buys a firearm, you do your 4473 paperwork and you uh, run an NICS check on them if they don't have, at least in the state of Georgia, their weapons carry license. Um, when you have that interview, and like I said, you need to show intent that you plan on being a business, have as much of that prepared as you can. So have a list of dealers that you plan on using to direct order farms from, whether that be Lipsy's, Xander's, Davidson's, Chattanooga, um, Sport South, MGE, MGE, Orion, there's tons of them. A lot of them have stipulations. Some of them don't work with home-based FFLs. Some of them require you to move a certain quantity of product. Um, so I didn't sign up for all of them, but me having that list of saying, hey, these are the people I'm going to contact once I get my FFL to try to apply, that showed that I did have intent. Also, your acquisitions and disposition book. Anytime a firearm comes in and out of your possession as a business, you have to log it in your acquisitions and disposition book. It's going to show where that gun came from. You log the date, the serial number, the type of firearm. You log the FFL number of the company that sent it to you. And then when you sell that gun, you log the date, who you sold it to, and the form 4473 if you sold it to an individual, or if you were to sell it to another FFL store, their FFL number goes in the acquisition and disposition book. So they're like 20 bucks on Amazon. They're not expensive. I bought mine ahead of time. That way I had it and could show the ATF agent, hey, I do plan on actually being a business. Um, and that really helped. So the other thing you're gonna need as a business is your sales and use tax certificate. So I applied for that in October of 2021 and got it the next month in November. Um, at that point, you're ready to start. When one thing that the agent did mention after I got my FFL, he said that I was able to begin gunsmithing activities and do FFL type work, but I wasn't allowed to sell firearms yet because I didn't have access to the NIC system. So I just waited. I, I guess you could do that if you wanted to, but also, like I said, the sales and use tax certificate that you have to get to pay your county taxes and here in the county that I, I live in, it's 8%. So until you get that and are able to pay that every month, uh, the previous month is due by the 20th of the next month, I didn't want to push that. I just waited. I waited till I had everything in line and trying to figure out the order in which to do things is a little bit confusing. And sometimes it was a little scary because I paid to become a business, paid a hundred dollars uh, to get my LLC. And then after I was granted my LLC, then had to go to the county and say, Hey, I have a business. I want to run it out of my home. If they told me no, it's kind of screwed at that point. But luckily they said yes and went down the line. Everyone was really helpful that I, I ended up dealing with. And a lot of it was I'd hit step A, do whatever that was, and then ask that person, hey, what's the next step? What do I do? And they guided me through the entire process. It was pretty simple. So... Let's talk about if it's worth it. So I have been, it's one year since I've become a small business as of this month. It is six months since I've had my FFL. So from the time that I had the dream and started, I'm gonna become an FFL till I was fully licensed was about seven months, right at seven months. And now I've been working as an FFL home-based part-time for six months. So let's talk about the cons first. There's a lot of paperwork you have to do. A lot of paperwork. Not just in the initial startup process, but every time a gun is sold. You can't, despite what a lot of people tell you, 
you cannot just walk into Walmart or any other big box store, pick a, a gun up off the shelf, throw it in the cart, and check out with your grapes, your chips, your Mountain Dew, salad, whatever, if you want to be healthy. You can't do that. There's 4473s to keep track of and handgun reports. So if I were to sell one person multiple handguns within a certain period of time, I have to file a multiple handgun sale report. ATF keeps track of that. Customers don't even know. They have no idea. You fill out the 4473, the, the customer and the seller, we fill that out kind of together. And then if I sold you two guns or if you came in on Monday and bought a, you know, a shield from me and then came back in that same Thursday and decided that you wanted to buy a Glock 19, we'd fill out another for, form 4473. And then after you left or just while you were doing other things, I'd fill out the multiple handgun sale report. That has to be sent to the ATF, also has to be sent to local law enforcement. Why they want to know, you bought two pistols within a five day period. I believe it's five days. Uh, off the top of my head, I should know that. Uh, beats me, but it's the law and it's the way that it is. It's also five business days, which means for me, for example, I let my home business be open seven days a week. So if somebody bought a gun from me on Monday and then they bought another pistol on Sunday, I don't have to file a multiple handgun sale report. But let's say I was only open on the weekends and you bought a gun from me on Saturday, August 1st. And then a week later, you bought a gun from me on Saturday, August 8th. Okay, more than five days have passed, but it's not five business days. So, it's a really weird thing that it's the same amount of time, real life time, the same amount of days have passed, but it wasn't business days for that business. And that's what it has to be for the owner or the seller of the firearm to decide whether or not they do the multiple handgun form, which you better do because they keep track of it very well. And they will get you if you do it incorrectly. Also, those Form 4473s, you have to keep paper records of them for 20 years. The ATF will come and audit you once a year, guaranteed. They could do it more if they wanted. That's one of the things you sign when you get your license. But once a year, they're going to visit your place of business. They're going to go through all your paperwork. They're going to check your acquisitions and disposition book. They're going to say, this, game, this gun came in, you bought it from you know, Xander's, logged it into your book, you sold it to Bill Smith uh, on Form 4473, number, you know, 36, show it to us. Have to go open your filing cabinet, they're going to go through it, they're going to go through all your Form 4473s with a fine tooth comb. Make sure you didn't miss anything, make sure it's filled out correctly, and make sure it's signed, dated, and the person that you sold it to was legally allowed to buy that gun that you ran your background check all that kind of information speaking of which it's getting a lot more stringent in current times so if you mess up a form 4473 I mean it's a penalty you, you depending on how bad you mess it up I've heard horror stories of people that have sold guns to people that should have been barred from owning a gun just because the person filled out the form and they, they didn't lie on it. They told the truth. The, the customer marked that they were a prohibited person and the seller just didn't look at it well enough and just said, oh, okay, everything's here, everything's in line, sign date, here's your gun, here you go. They go do something terrible. The ATF or the police officers look that gun, track it down from the manufacturer. Manufacturer says, I sold it to this distributor. That distributor says, I sold it to this business. 
they come to your door, they say, hey, we need the 4473 for this gun. Where's it at? They look at it, say, hey, they, they marked on here that they were prohibited. Why'd you sell it to them? You just lost your license and you're probably going to jail. I mean, it, that's just one of the things. If they lie, on the other hand, that's not on you. So if that, and that's where you also get into straw purchases and things like that. Um, if, if they lie on that form, that doesn't come back to bite you unless it's completely obvious that the form was forged. But it is a ton of paperwork. So just know that up front. Uh, the other thing is, you're not going to get rich. You're not. Markups on guns, average 50 bucks. Uh, I buy a gun from one of my distributors, 500 bucks. I mark it at 550, sell it, add on 8% sales tax, which jacks it up even more for the customer. That's not profit that I get. That's what I have to pay the state at the uh, end of every month, I might make 50 bucks. And then if the customer uses a credit card to pay for it, so yeah, let's, let's use that example. Buy a $500 gun from my distributor. That's my cost. I sell it to Bill for 550 bucks. I net 50 bucks in my pocket. Bill has to pay 8% sales tax on a $550 gun what $44 so he's paying 594 bucks all right then bill when we get to check out pulls out a credit card okay no big deal except the seller pays a average of 3% credit card fee that's gonna eat into a lot of your profits um, so if I was making 50 bucks on that gun and then credit card fee get swiped and it's 16 17 18 dollars whatever that is that just ate a pretty good percentage of your profit you just went from a 10 percent profit margin which isn't a lot to a 6.7 ish percent profit margin just because it, a card was used so you're definitely not going to get rich doing it but Ammo profitability is even worse, especially for a very small business like what I have. So big box stores, huge, huge sporting stores buy ammo by the truckloads. I mean, truckloads, and they get huge discounts for it. Buying in bulk, you get a discount. It's a common thing. Costco, you know, something everybody knows. I can't afford to do that. I cannot afford to buy that quantity of ammo and tie up that much of my money in ammo that's going to sit on the shelf. Those stores can. Uh, I have found, walking through other stores, that I see prices on the shelves for customers that's just right at exactly what I pay for it from my distributor. It, it, it's kind of crazy, and it kind of makes you feel bad. Uh, one thing that I've started doing is I've moved away from ammunition. I, I tell a bunch of my clients, like, look, I can't compete. In my area, we've got some big box stores that, that do sell ammo, and I, I just can't compete with them. And I'm honest. I tell them that. I say, hey, I'd be happy to sell you the gun. I can usually spank the big box stores on guns because they're going to go straight for MSRP. With me, uh, since I'm home-based and I have a lot lower overhead, which I'll talk about in just a second, I, I can work deals and I can get a better price, but ammo, it's just not there. The, it's just not. And that's one of the things I wished I had known when I first started. That's another thing I'll get to in a second. So, accessories on guns. That's where you have a better markup. So, I've got some window mags, Gen 3 P mags, that I, that are for the AR-15 that complete openness I pay $12.55 through my distributor for they I think the MSRP form is 16 bucks I sell them for 15 bucks so 12.55 I sell them for 15 I make $2.45 
off of a uh, magazine for an AR-15, which that's a 16% profit margin. A lot better than your guns that it's 10% if they pay cash, you're looking at 6.7, 6.5, depending on the amount um, and if they use a card uh, on actual firearms. But the other con to a home-based FFL like what I have, and, and this is the way that I chose to do it. You can take out loans, maybe you're wealthy. I'm not wealthy. But inventory up front. And one thing that I really wish I had known was to keep less inventory on hand. I had a set amount of money that I was going to put into my business. I had about $500 in startup costs between your home application fee, your business license fee, your FFL fees, uh, getting fingerprinted, getting your passport photo taken, all these things, mailing off, paperwork. It cost me about $500 to start up. And then I had some money left over. I said, I'm going to go ahead. I'm going to get stuff on the shelves, get ammo stocked, get accessories stocked, get all this so I look, I look good, look official. Shelves aren't barren. You don't want your shelves to be barren. But you also don't know exactly what people are going to want. So I spent a considerable amount of money through my distributors. And some of the stuff that I bought when I first opened is still sitting on the shelf. $1,000 in inventory, $2,000 in inventory that is gathering dust because I didn't understand the market. I thought it was going to be things that people would want to buy and it hasn't happened yet. So it'll sell, it'll eventually sell, but that money that's tied up in that inventory nobody wants yet could have been put to work doing something else. It could have been, you know, turning over more, more popular products. So that, that's just one thing that I really wish I had known going in. Um, another con to home-based uh, FFLs is your impulse buys are really low for the exact scenario that I just laid out. You don't have a lot of inventory on hand. Uh, I do a lot of orders through my website, bunkermunitions.com. But when someone comes, uh, I also do transfers. So if somebody were to buy a gun off gun broker or through a large online store and they're in my area, it can't just be shipped to their house. It has to come to me. I charge a transfer fee and I have no money tied up in it. Gun shows up at the door, I check the paperwork, log into my A&D book, call them, say, hey, I've got your gun here. They come pick it up, charge them a transfer fee, they're out the door, and I never had any money tied up in the situation. Also, you get a new potential customer that way. They come in, you get to talking, say, hey, I see you bought this. You know, next time, give me a shot. I, I might get you a better deal than what you got. If you're looking for something else, keep me in mind. I find it a good, a good thing to do. I read online in the forums that a lot of gun stores don't like to do transfers because of the excessive paperwork that comes with it. Like I said, the multiple handgun sale forms, the 4473s that you have to keep track of for 20 years in paper format. If you do a lot of volume, you are going to have filing cabinets and boxes piled with 4473s that you have to keep organized and searchable for when the ATF comes. I see it as a benefit. I'm getting somebody that may not have contacted me otherwise into the door and I'm getting to meet them face to face. I've met some really great, really interesting people that way and had repeat customers that come through and then next time they need a gun, they'll call me and, and it just works. I enjoy doing it. So th those are the cons. I didn't mean to go too much on the cons, but I'm going to talk about the pros. All right. Being home-based, we've got a very low overhead. I pay my mortgage whether or not I'm running this business. My mortgage, my light bill, my internet, everything like that, it, it, it's getting paid whether this business was here or not. 
my main uh, my main costs for running the business are my website fee, my processing network fee for being able to take cards, and things like that. Um, all of it totals out to about $170 a month, which, if you remember, about a $50 markup on most guns. You might get a little bit better of a markup if you're doing really high-end guns, like several thousand dollar guns. You're going to make more than 50 bucks. But for your average person that's coming in looking to buy a, you know, a Ruger to carry around or a Glock or just a shotgun for home defense, you're not going to be making much. But, so, about $170 a month is what I need just to break even. So, that also doesn't include other expenses associated with the business. Advertising. I had shirts made. I love these shirts. I don't know how much you can see in the back, but I love them. I had a friend of mine make them. She did a fantastic job. I paid her for those. Business cards. had those made. It, the paper bags that you buy in, in bulk to give to customers as they're walking out when they buy ammo or buy optics or um, magazines. You know, they can't just carry it out juggling to the, to the driveway. I almost said the parking lot. Out to the driveway. You got to give them a bag. Might not seem like much. Might break down to eight, ten cents a bag. But it, it's still a cost. Um, paper. I'm going to print stuff off. Print off information for customers. Computer paper. Ink. Having your taxes filed at the end of the year. All those things are added business costs that you have to keep track of. And it moves your markup every uh, licenses. Your license renewals. So you have to renew some license, licenses every year. Your FFLs are good for three years. Break that down per month over a three-year period and keep that in. That's, that's your target that you need to hit to break even. So now we're looking at maybe closer to 250 bucks to, to break even. Which doesn't seem like a lot. 250 bucks in profit doesn't seem like a lot. But when you do it part-time, uh, it, it can be, especially starting up. I've had my FFL for six months now. So I'm starting to snowball, getting there. You know, you, you meet people, word of mouth spreads. It gets there, but it's tough, and you can't get discouraged in the beginning. Um, that's the other pro. You just have to love it. I love guns. I do. Love everything. I love researching them. I love the history of old military guns. I've done videos on this channel of, like, the Craig Jorgensen, the Trapdoor Springfield. I plan to do more. I've got, like, some 1917s, uh, M1 Garands stuff like that. I, I just love them. So if I ran this business and broke even, got to meet other great people that are also interested in the hobby that I love, that's a win for me. I get to talk. I get to enjoy it. I get to research it. You're not going to get rich. I don't need to get rich doing it. I, I just love it. I enjoy it. And if anybody's still li listening... At this point in the video, <laughs> I hope that's what they take away. I sounded super negative in the beginning because it, it's hard. It's not easy. It's not as easy as I thought it was going to be. I knew it was going to be difficult. I didn't know it was going to be that tedious and that difficult. It came out a little cheaper than I was expecting it to be, honestly. But you have to love it. Um, the other thing is... Owning your own business, like I just said, you're not going to get rich, but the potential is there. So I work a nine-to-five job. I work for a major university uh, doing maintenance. I can calculate my yearly salary for the rest of my time there until I plan to retire. I know exactly how much money I'm going to make for the rest of my life if I were to keep working that nine-to-five job. It kind of bummed me out to know that's where I max out, at, max out at. If I keep sitting behind this desk, that's where I'm going to be. That's what kind of got me motivated to start a business. 
the potential upside is limitless. It is what you make it, what you put into it, and it doesn't always work. I, I mean, any business can go out of business. You're, you're not always going to hit it big. But if you enjoy it and if you put in the time, eventually you have to believe that it's going to happen. It just will. And I enjoy that. I enjoy the thought of I could make this bigger. I could make this better. What could I do to expand? What could I do to grow? What could I do to get new customers in? What could I do to help more people, bring more people in to the firearm hobby? Destigmatize all these guns. What could I do? And have a profitable business on the side. It's always a great thing. So I, I really don't have a lot more. Uh, that's kind of what I wanted to talk about. It was more of a strain of consciousness, just rambling. But that's been my journey so far. And like I said, don't jump in. If you do this, don't jump in too hard too fast. You could take out loans if you wanted to. I didn't take out any loans. I sold part of my personal collection saved up some money and I whenever I make money I reinvest it back into the business buy more stuff have a bigger account that way I can order better guns for stuff or for people but as I mentioned earlier the biggest thing I wish I had known is to not tie up so much money so fast sitting on the shelf over there I've got a good bit of inventory that, like I said, it'll move eventually, even if I buy it for myself for the guns that I have. If I want to go to the range, I'll pull it off the shelf, sell it to myself, pay sales tax on it. Because as a business, when you order in product, you're not the end user, so you don't pay the 8% sales tax. But when I sell it to myself and move it from my personal account into my business account, I do have to pay that sales tax and claim it at the end of the month. So, I, I'm not worried about that. But, I wish I just had a little bit more, I had left it more liquid to be able to put that money to work buying other things instead of it sitting on a shelf. But, that's, that's my process, that's my journey from May 2021 to November 2021 six seven months I went and went from a dream a thought to I've got license in hand I'm ready to rock and roll and then from November to it just turned June uh, June 2022 so it took me about seven months for the process and I've been in it for about six now I'm happy what else could you ask for I love it I love talking about it I love doing it I'm gonna quit rambling I'm gonna let you guys go but that's how it is. Again, I'm Ross Myers with Bunker Munitions. Thank you.